ASA, the first pharmaceutical intervention I ever learned to use, Q-nostalgia, which is a very easy way to bring about a measurable reduction in patient mortality for myocardial infarctions in the pre-hospital environment, or in other words, serving larves. It can also be used for anti-inflammatory and analgesic purposes. Let's take a look at its rap sheet. ASA, chemical name acetosalicylic acid, often sold under the brand name aspirin, class, analgesic, antipyretic, and antithrombic, although sometimes just referred to as an NSAID. Route oral, typically. Dose varies from 80 mg daily for prevention of cardiovascular disease such as heart attacks and stroke, 160 to 325 mg for mortality reduction in suspected acute myocardial infarctions, and 650 to 4 grams a day for inflammation and pain relief. Mechanism of action. Small dose, around 80 mg daily, bonds to enzyme COX-1, which inhibits its ability to make thromboxane A2, a lipid responsible for activation of new platelets and their aggregation. Medium dose inhibits COX-1 and 2, blocking the production of prostaglandins. By limiting prostaglandins, we limit the inflammation, redness, swelling, and fever that they would normally cause. Indications. When would we want to inhibit platelets' ability to form blockages? Well, when clot formation or increase in size could prove problematic for a patient like in myocardial infarction, primarily caused by a clot blocking a blood vessel in the heart. You don't want that blockage getting any bigger by platelets getting together for unwanted parties. The next indication is pyrexia. Prostaglandins cause fevers, and by stopping prostaglandins from being produced, you eliminate the fever they were causing, or at the very least taper it down a couple notches. Prostaglandins are also responsible for lowering your nociceptor threshold, or in other words, the threshold in which your nerves send painful signals to your brain. Less prostaglandins, less pain. Contraindications or reason to avoid or be cautious of ASA administration are as follows. Allergies to salicylates, as acetosalicylic acid is a salicylate. Say that five times fast. Allergies to any other NSAID, as this allergy might also apply to ASA. History of salicylate or other NSAIDs causing an asthma attack. It's not fully understood why ASA causes asthma attacks in some patients, but it likely has something to do with prostaglandin synthesis inhibition causing a biochemical chain reaction resulting in an aggravation of the patient's asthma. Aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease is currently best identified by the patient having a past history of ASA inducing asthma attacks, so in other words just ask the patient, has ASA or any other anti-inflammatory ever caused you to have an asthma attack? Active bleeding or prone to bleeding. Why? Because although ASA's ability to tell platelets to calm down is handy in some situations, platelets doing what they normally do is important in the stopping of blood flow. You'll notice if you ever have a patient that takes medication that inhibits the blood's ability to clot, it is significantly harder to stop their bleeding. Even from a simple IV poke, you just can't get that leak to plug. Not having your cardiac arteries jam up is handy, but so is not bleeding out. The next one is abdominal discomfort and peptic ulcers. ASA, despite its well-documented benefits, can be a bit rough on your GI tract, causing increased levels of acid to be produced in your stomach, which can lead to wearing of your gastrointestinal lining and cause bleeding, which is also complicated by the factor of ASA making your body not clot as well, which means that once a GI bleed starts, you're going to have a hard time stopping. Tinnitus, or ringing in the ears. Not seen as commonly anymore now that we have a much wider array of anti-inflammatory medications to choose from. But high-dose aspirin used to be prescribed much more commonly, which sometimes resulted in a condition called salicylism, which would cause tinnitus or sometimes even full-on loss of hearing. Ray's syndrome or Rise syndrome, which is brain and liver dysfunction linked to the use of ASA in patients that are less than 19 years old. Do not give these patients ASA. Liver or kidney problems. ASA is biotransformed into salicylate, which is metabolized mainly by the liver. If your liver isn't working so good, it's going to take longer to metabolize and going to change your dosing considerations. Same goes for your kidney. If your body can't excrete the ASA metabolites very well, it increases your risk of the ASA byproducts building up in your system. Taking other NSAIDs, as you have to be careful not to overload a body with too many NSAIDs. Pregnancy, especially during the third trimester, it can cause defects in the baby's development. Gout, as ASA can affect change in the levels of uric acid, but usually only seen when dosing at medium levels. Combination with alcohol, as alcohol and aspirin can increase your risk of GI bleeds. If the patient is on methotrexate, ASA can increase the effects of methotrexate, a medication sometimes used in the treatment of cancer. Some additional notes on aspirin. 
Aspirin, when chewed, is absorbed much faster, although you want to have a good tasting aspirin if you're going to direct a patient to do this. The regular stuff's nasty. Also, as an industry, we could be doing a better job of educating the public on having appropriate dosing of ASA readily available in all homes. Most emergency medical dispatchers can instruct patients with suspected myocardial infarction to take ASA before the paramedics arrive. It's well accepted that the faster you get ASA into a patient's body, the greater chance they have of surviving a heart attack. One of the largest contributors to this early ASA not being given though is that the patient just plain doesn't have any available to take. If we did more public education on how important it is to have ASA in the home, whether for you or a friend, we could make a sizable dent in the largest cause of mortality in the world, cardiovascular disease. Thanks very much for watching this video. If you have any suggestions for improving the information presented, please let me know. Anything I missed, misrepresented, or could have gone more into depth on, let me know.